Good evening and welcome to Night Colors Bigfoot Radio. You are here with your hosts, Dustin Clark and Lauren Smith. How are you doing tonight, Dustin? I am doing pretty good. I'm kind of tired because we had my uh, three-year-old's birthday party today at a pizza place and a uh, bunch of screaming kids <laughs> and lots of pizzas just kind of worn me down, but I'm feeling all right. How are you? <clears throat> I'm good. Um, I drove across the state today, so I'm kind of uh, still a little wiped out. Um, <clears throat> and the rain, it's been, you know, I have to go over the weather real quick. Everybody waits for my weather reports. Um, <laughs> so the rain today has just been nonstop all day, and it really sucks because on the way home, I wanted to stop by the wildlife refuge and hike through the parallel forest, you know, and all that, but the rain was relentless. I did go through the wildlife refuge, and I did go to Mount Scott, um, drove up to the top so my kids could be up there, and uh, it's open again. I don't know how many of our listeners are from that area. I know at least one or two, so FYI, Mount Scott's open again. It's been open for about a month, so you can now go up there and do what you need to do. (laughs) Luckily, it only rained for about five minutes here today. So. What? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, about 30 minutes ago, and that was about it. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got rained on the entire day. Like, the entire day, it just poured on me. That's lame. Well, anyway, hopefully... Mother Nature got it all out of her system because this weekend is the Falk Monster Campout at Alex Smith Park, and uh, it starts Friday, ends on Sunday. We are going to be having kind of storytelling every night by the fire, and on Saturday, the vendors will be available for everyone to purchase their goods. Um, We're going to be having a raffle around 5 o'clock, and those Um, proceeds benefit the park. Again, this is a free event, but donations are welcome and will go towards the upkeep um, of Alex Smith Park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you need to uh, find the Google pinpoint of it, uh, if you go on to our uh, Nightcaller's Bigfoot page, um, find the event and it'll show the location in the uh, Directions. Details. 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 <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, I did put the pin in there, and then I reposted it because it was not being found easily. And um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of what else. There is not water or electrical hookups. Um, there is a bathroom. It's not flush toilets, no showers. Um, it is called a camp out, so we're going to be camping out. And um, the water's up, but it's not affecting the camping spots as far as I know. And um, most of the, like the main fire will be around the big pavilion. Most of the events are going to be held at the big pavilion. So that's where you can go see everyone and kind of mingle and greet everybody. It is bring, be, I don't know how to say this, bring your own food, bring your own beverages there will be a food truck there but um just keep in mind you know bring your own stuff um we recommend you know you go into town and go to monster mart and sightsee a little bit if you have a canoe or kayak you can go across the lake and that's always really fun Mm -hmm. um also there will be a troop of boy scouts there um so everyone be on your best behavior so that they think that all bigfoot researchers are the most awesome people on the whole planet Michael Waldy. <laughs> <laughs> keep it clean, people. Keep it clean. Um, keep it clean or Keith Crabtree will get you. And that's one person you just really, you know, don't want to have to pick you up by your collar and shake you. All right. Well, um, we hope to see everybody there this weekend. Um, we hope everybody has a great time and... Um, gets to meet and greet everyone on their list of people to meet and greet. And I am ready to talk to our guest. How about you? 
All right. Let's introduce them. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were going to read out it. Okay. Uh, tonight we have the awesome Lyle Blackburn in 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 the build. Well, not building, but he's here with us. <laughs> How are you doing? You're doing tonight, great. Lyle? Keep going. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No problem. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, so what got each, got you interested in Bigfoot? Uh, well, it's pretty much one of those things I was always interested as far back as I can remember. Uh, you know, I loved horror movies and things like that. And then at some point I got a couple of books um, that had stories about the Yeti and Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster. And, you know, those really captured my imagination because I thought, you know, man, this is like these these are things I might see in real life, you know, and it, you know, it captured my imagination. It scared me. And, uh, you know, but all those things seemed far away. I think I'd seen the Patterson Gimlin film and, you know, that kind of creeped me out. And I grew up hunting with my father. He's a bow hunter. And so we had been out to, you know, all sorts of woods and camped and been to Arkansas and Texas. And uh, so I was familiar with the environments and then, you know, just thinking, wow, I might see some, something like what I see on the Patterson Gimlin film. But, you know, in my mind that didn't live anywhere near where we lived. And then at some point I saw the legend of Boggy Creek at a drive in. And of course, you know, that dramatizes the sightings uh, of a creature much closer uh, to home to where I lived in Texas. So about three hours away. So at that point on, that just became the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen. And, and uh, it sort of followed me through life and, you know, and then eventually I, I wrote a book on it and that's kind of what got me into the whole world of the Bigfoot, I guess. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think the Your Top Monster book is one of my favorites. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting some of the others. I've got a few of yours, but I'm still collecting them. Um, while we're on the topic of The Legend of Boggy Creek, um, which, one of the Falc- which one of the historical Falk Monster encounters is uh, your favorite? Um, as in ones from the from the movie, or I oh yeah, sorry, the sorry, from the movie. <laughs> so from the movie, uh, I always like the Mary Beth Cersei sighting, um, the one where the scene where she's out at the well and the sun's dropping, and then uh, you know the the sisters in the bed saying Mary Beth put a Mary Beth put something over the window, the baby's gonna catch a cold, and then she looks <laughs> out and and see something lurking out there in the woods. And to me, that was, I don't know, it just, I remember being scared by that when I was a kid. And then I liked the look of their house and everything. And so, you know, fast forward into modern times, I've, I've been in that house. I've sat there, I've looked out the window where she had the sighting and I've stood where the creature stood. And what, in fact, what you see in the movie there for those that, or aficionados of the movie, that is the Cersei house. That is actually where the sighting occurred in 1964, and that's what's shown in the movie. So it's very cool because it really ties together the, you know, the the historical sighting with what was shown in the Legend of Boggy Creek. So for me, that was always, I don't know, kind of one of my favorites. Wow, I did not know that that that, that was the actual house. That's yeah, cool. it's it. it yeah, and it's uh, it's still standing barely. It's some of it's collapsed now, but I mean, it was that house was built I think in the 1800s, and uh, Mary Beth's mother was born there. It's that old that her, like her mother was actually born in the house. And then, um, it's just a little trivia about that scene in Legend of Boggy Creek. The girl who is in the bed calling out, saying, "Mary Beth, come put the you know thing over the window." That is actually mm-hmm. Mary Beth. Mary Beth was playing oh, wow. the sister, but that's actually Mary Beth Cersei. So, a little uh, geeky trivia there. <laughs> um, have you ever been out to the? Uh, I, for, I think it's Old Man Jones or, or Herb Jones. Have you ever been out to uh, where his shack was out at, on Marshall Bayou? I'm sure it's not, you know, not standing anymore, but. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. It, it was called Big Mound. It's on Mercer, 
between a place called Carter Lake and Mercer Bayou. Uh, yeah, I've been out there several times, and in fact, I I went out there and ex- excavated a bunch of the the spot where the shack used to be, um, and dug up a bunch of you know bottles and personal effects of his, and found parts of the there was a tent that he had next to the shack. I've got a big old piece of that, and um, you know, just sort of sat out there, literally where that shack used to stand. Uh, so it was pretty cool to you know, visit that site um, where that guy had lived. That's awesome. Um, now, I'm I'm friends with you on Facebook, and I see you always posting out, uh, posting pictures of being in Falk and uh, the Boggy Creek area. Uh, how much time do you think you spend researching out there in that, that area? Uh, like, probably. I mean, more than any other place, for sure. Um, you know, I go I go up there every few months, I guess, just as time permits. Um, you know, and I've been doing that for about a, a decade or so. You know, and I mean, some of it is, if I go there, I don't necessarily always, you know, tromp through the woods. Sometimes I take a canoe trip or down one of the other waterways or just just go there and visit people i've got so many friends that i'll uh, just literally drop by and talk to people and i get a lot of uh information that way you know has there been any sightings or what's going on with uh you know things in the town or what's going on so part of the part of it is always just kind of keeping up with with everything that's going on there you know from what people have seen to you know, going in the woods myself and enjoy, you know, just even enjoying the the nature there. Yeah, that's, uh, it's always peaceful when I've gone down there. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, have you had any encounters, possible encounters down there in the Boggy Creek area? Uh, I've never had a visual encounter. Uh, a couple of times... You know, there's been things where I, uh, you know, could could possibly have been near one of these. Uh, several years ago, my, my late researcher partner, Tom Shirley, and I were down there in Mercer, and uh, we heard a, a really distinctive howl uh, that repeated three times. And, uh, we, you know, we were just, by the time it, we heard it the third time, we are like, man, this is... We, we couldn't explain what it was, you know, maybe maybe it's the creature or what have you. And so uh, we ended up uh, taking a canoe back down Mercer. And when we got back down to where we were camping on the side of, uh, of the bayou there, whatever this thing was, it followed us. I assume it had followed us, but it was like right across the, where, where we had gotten out of the canoe and started howling again. And I just plunged down there with a... Uh, flashlight trying to you know catch a glimpse of it but it, it just moved so fast it was gone and then howled again in the distance so uh, you know it's possible it could have been one of the creatures and uh it was you know we found some scant footprints and other things where you kind of get that feeling that something could be nearby you know it's like that realization that of the uh, romanticize this whole thing, but if you're out there in the middle of the woods in the middle of night in a swamp and you realize, <laughs> wait a minute, this thing could be, you know, just sitting there watching us. It's, you know, it's a sobering thought. But uh, those are the those are the two times where, uh, you know, perhaps I was close, but I've never, unfortunately, never had a visual sighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, just. Uh We've heard the howls in southeast Oklahoma, and uh, it's it's spooky, but it's exciting at the same time. And it seems like they're always just out of reach. It seems like you can never get close enough to them. Um, what is the oh sorry? What is the scariest? encounter you've had while researching whether it be with hogs or humans humans are the worst 
What's that? Kind of, Come back on that. Oh, I should, uh, <laughs> what's the what's the scariest encounter you've had while out researching, whether in Boggy Creek or anywhere else that you've gone? Oh, oh, the scariest. Uh, uh, trying to think of anything that was truly scary, really. I mean, I I think probably the some of the scariest stuff is the further back it was up in the Washita's once and so far off the the road so far back in there that um something something was large was in the woods and it it's just that kind of same feeling where if something happens to me out here you know even if I'm trying to get back to civilization, I'm so far away, much less if something happens to me and the person I was with, I'm only with one other person. If we disappeared, nobody would ever find us. Sort of that realization that you're in the middle of about as remote as you can get in you know, in our area. If if there's a remote spot, that was it. And you you realize you're not the you may not be the king of your domain, you know, it's, it's dark, you know, our eyesight isn't great in the dark, you know, there's things out there that are, uh, that's where they live. It's their environment. They're, you know, they're nocturnal. They can see, they could be in the case of Bigfoot bigger than you. So that's just kind of the Mm -hmm. scariest stuff. There's never really been a, haven't run up on any hillbillies or anything like that. So, uh, (laughs) Except feeling of being prey. Yeah, so. Yeah, not not feeling like you own the world like normally meant, well, humans do. Yeah, it's a very um, humbling feeling. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think that's when people people don't realize, you know, when you're talking about this stuff in context of, well, you know, where would these things live, you know, but if somebody dropped you off in the middle of, uh, you know, Sulphur River bottoms, or if they dropped you off in the middle of Washita's and say, you know, find your way back, mm-hmm. and and by the way, there's miles and miles of woods. I think people would go, uh, yeah, anything could live out here, and just be 20 yards out of sight, and you'd never see it. So there's a mm-hmm. lot more dangerous areas than people realize. Mm. Absolutely. Um. um Go ahead. I was gonna say uh, we have a listener that wants to know if there's a uh, if you know more of a backstory to the old man or the old man Herb Jones. Uh, yeah, somewhat. Um, I've gotten to know some of his family members so um, over the years and, and uh, ask a few questions, and I know that you retired uh, Sheriff Phillips that was the sheriff on duty in Miller County when the Boggy Creek stuff was going on in the heyday of the 70s. So, you know, periodically I'll ask him about Herb Jones. And in the future when I do my third, the third in my Boggy Creek trilogy, I'm going to have a whole section on Herb Jones because people ask me about him quite a bit. He's an interesting character. But he was, you know, he's a real guy, and that was his real name. Um, Back in there, there's a place called Jonesville, which is, a community southwest of Falk, and a lot of the Jones family lived there and still do. Um, Herb Jones was one of those early early guys that moved to the area, and he uh, had just decided to live off the grid, if you will. And so he lived back in there for, I think, more than 20 years, 30 years or so, um, in that place he built himself, and nobody really bothered him. Um, And people would bring him things. Travis, what you see in the movie, I mean, people would bring him supplies. He didn't get around well. He had this, he had had an accident. They said he shot his foot off in a boating accident, which sounds kind of weird, but but he did truly have that, uh, you know, an injury and limped around. So, I mean, he wasn't, you know, a guy that could really get around much, but uh, he, uh, he lived down there, and after The Legend of Boggy Creek was filmed, unfortunately, it kind of made people aware of where he was, and a, 
a bunch of kids went by and shot up all the bottles out of his trees and kind of messed with him, and that was unfortunate. And then uh, later on, he died. He fell through the boards in the bottom of that shack and became wedged and couldn't get out, and he succumbed to the uh, cold temperatures and and just literally – died of exposure out there and uh sheriff phillips said he went in there and nobody had heard from him for a while and and or something and somebody went out there and found him dead in that shack so he lived there till he died and uh probably would have been a really interesting character i I wish i could have interviewed him you know in person uh but i would have had to start this project a little little sooner but interesting guy I, I didn't know all of that about him. That's crazy. That wouldn't. That kind of sucks that after the movie came came out, people came and screwed with him and shot all. Because that, that's one of the coolest things. Well, besides the monster in the movies, all the jokes he had hanging up in the the trees. I always thought that looked really cool, and for you know, dumb humans to come and just shoot them all out. I just kind of. It's, so. Yeah, it's a shame. That was some of the backlash of of the movie. It's of course, you know, people were wanted to go down there and whether they were hunting the monster and and trespassing on private property. It was just it was a whole bunch of that going on, you know, which was a big problem for the town and for the sheriff and and all that. So, but but yeah, I, I definitely plan to. To do some further interviews with the family members to get even more of, of Herb's backstory. So when I write that up in the book, it'll you know we can figure out you know all the tidbits of what he did before and why, what led him to to want to live off the grid like that. I cannot mm-hmm. wait to read that. That is awesome. Okay, so uh, the three toed prints that were found in that. After- was a soybean field? Yeah, a soybean in, in the movie, field. The um, yeah, that was what June June of seventy one. Yeah. I was gonna say, what do you think of the three toe prints? Do you think it's from inbreeding? Do you think it was from an injury? Or what do you think? Well, I mean, I talked to several several people who had been there and observed the tracks in person, including uh, some of the local news news reporters and some of my friends in Falk. Um, it was kind of a split opinion on whether that was a real track or a hoax. Um, there's a lot of things that stack up negative against it as being a hoax, but at the same time, if it was, the, the length of the trackway and the, and the way they were made and no evidence of any, any, you know, hoaxing or human footprints, it, it was really hard to imagine that somebody could have made those. Um, if you look at a, the best way to see it is a, is a photo of the track. The, the castings that you see just look in, kind of amorphous and indistinct. But if you look at a photo, which there's one in my Beast of Boggy Creek book, um, you see this long, narrow foot, and it's a long foot that doesn't really atom- – the anatomy of it would not really support something being seven foot tall. So either it was a a deformity, and, of course, that would result in three toes because, as we know, there's no primates on Earth that have anything short of five toes, and most Bigfoot tracks are five toes, which makes perfect sense because that's the natural construction that allows an, an upright bipedal creature to walk its best. But the three toe, uh, you know, could result in a small population inbreeding, which creates deformities, and those deformities usually manifest first in feet and hands. Um, or, you know, could it have been something like an injury? Um, you know, there's a lot of gators down there, but if you look at the track, it doesn't look like an injured foot. It looks like a foot that was, you know, made that way from the get-go. So 
for me, without having been there to look at the trackway in person, um, you know, I can't say one way or the no- another. And people have told me all kinds of stories over the years to what they think that is. But I'm still in the middle as to whether that uh, is, you know, actual evidence of of the creature or if somebody did a very clever hoax. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle as well. I mean, it there's a possibility something, or it could have stepped in one of them old school bear traps and knocked them off, or I don't know. It's I would like to see one. I don't believe I've seen the cast of it. There, yeah, I mean, there's I a cast of it in Monster Mart, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There is. Yeah. There's one there that was taken, uh, and it's broken in three pieces now. But when you see that cast, it's like I said, the photo is the photo that was taken by the Texarkana Gazette is the best thing to that we have to analyze now because you can see uh, a better outline. I mean, it's definitely not something. Both feet couldn't have been you know, stuck in a bear trap or been bitten by a gator and co- and come off looking exactly uh, the same with only three toes. So it seemed like the thing would have had to have either three toes, which is something that Southern Bigfoot, you know, is known to have. But uh, there's, there's more frequently, you know, five-toed prints than three. But yeah, the, the photo is the best way to kind of look at it, and I've kind of blown that photo up and enhanced it and this and that to try to and in fact I actually made a replica of it of the foot using the photo I blew it up to to scale and then used that to sculpt the foot and that foot is like a 3D representation of what that thing looked like and that gives you a real sense of is this even a foot of a, of a primate like creature or not Mm-hmm. That is interesting. Um, so I have a question outside of um, Boggy Creek and uh, that area. So you're you're into Sasquatch, Bigfoot, but you're also into other cryptids. What made you branch out into other cryptids? Uh, well, I just, I mean, really to me, I just write, I just like, stories of mysterious monsters. I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. kind of what... In When I wrote The Beast of Boggy Creek, it wasn't to write a book about Bigfoot. It was just that I loved the legend of Boggy Creek and that the story of, of all that and the making of the movie and the effect it had on the town. So um, mm-hmm. the second, my second book is, Li- is Lizard Man, the true story of the Bishopville monster, which is a story of a mm-hmm. reptilian-type creature that was seen in a uh, swampy area in uh, South Carolina. And so that was another mm-hmm. kind of weird case where a bunch of people had reported seeing this almost like a creature from the Black Lagoon type thing in this swampy area. It had a big effect on the town. You know, there was police investigations into the whole matter, and the thing had allegedly attacked a kid. And so, you know, I thought, I love that story. I'm going to go out there to to South Carolina and I'm going to talk to this retired sheriff and I'm going to look into this story and see if it's something that is interesting enough and it and indeed it was and I thought it made a great story so that that became the second book um so you know but within all that of course Bigfoot is sort of the you know the uh the heavy hitter and it's like the most there's the most to those cases so in my my third book, mm-hmm. Beyond Boggy Creek, then I just examined the whole, the whole entirety of the Southern Bigfoot phen- phenomenon. So, really, I just like cool, cool stories. I love Bigfoot, and I love all the sightings of really any of it, Thunderbirds and mm-hmm. uh, lake monsters. I'm just fascinated with with every bit of it. Right. Um, have you heard of the Kentucky Goblins? Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm friends with Talk Geraldine. The the girl who was in the okay. 
in the house at the time. Mhm. Oh, were you? Okay. Um, yeah, she's you? she's Sorry. she. I wasn't there, but she was. So yeah, I've since gotten to know her. Yeah, yeah. She, she was young at the time, but uh, yeah, that's a that's just a classic, just a great cool incident, and you know one that it happened. You know, we can't say what those things were, but it wasn't a hoax. Mm-hmm. People didn't make that up. You know, it something happened to that family. Mhm. Yeah, and it's um I don't know if you've seen Hellier, but like it's actually that same phenomena has happened all over those states, um, in multiple areas. So kinda like Bigfoot, it's um not just he's not Santa Claus, he doesn't just pop up in one spot and then go to the next, you know, it's um uh, all over. Yeah, yeah I definitely, had uh, yeah. Lauren <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Uh, Lauren recently took a trip, an outing to Kentucky, and uh, I was pestering her about the goblins were going to get her. <laughs> yeah, the whole time. <laughs> you know, when you're out yeah, I'll, um, I'll... researching Sasquatch, you hear um, you hear something moving through the woods, and it's huge. You think, or you know, sneaking. You think, okay, that's a that's a Bigfoot. Well, when you're out. You know, and you hear something small while you're out there, and you just don't think much of it. It's a squirrel, it's a rabbit, it's a possum, armadillo, whatever. You just don't think much because it's not, it doesn't sound big. And so Dustin just very kindly, as I'm heading off for a four-day hike into Kentucky, very kindly reminds me, hey, if something small runs at you, it's probably a Kentucky goblin. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's that's that's, <laughs> that's what's going on up there, so... I don't know if I'd yeah. rather run into a, a Bigfoot or a or a goblin. I, maybe not. Maybe I'll pick the Bigfoot. That's yeah, what I, I said. I'd Bigfoot rather have something well. big. Yeah, I'd have something big bluff charge me, and you know I'm gonna go out fighting. But something small, oh, it creeps me out. I can't do it. I'm just not a fan. And the lizard man, that whole thing scares me as well. I don't know why that scares me more than. Sasquatch, um, Rougarou, anything like that. The, like something reptilian scares me more than something hairy. I don't know why. It's weird. Also, the rake. The rake <laughs> yeah. creeps me out as well. <laughs> well, I think I think in some ways we can almost get our minds around Bigfoot. I mean, if it's a so, you know a mm-hmm. relic hominid or some sort of a species of ape or whatever it is, it's it's a little closer to what we understand, but you start getting outside of that to, you know, what just what is a reptilian humanoid, you know, that brings in a lot of other possibilities. And the, and the goblins, you know, it's like your imagination, what could that be? So I think they're scarier just because they get further outside of the, the realm of explanation. And, you know, they just the sort of things of our nightmares and our ancestors' nightmares. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, what do you think Bigfoot is? Well, I mean, I I don't have a, a definitive answer, obviously, as, as none of us do. So, my my opinion is that it is a species of ape that probably had come here, you know, from from Asia across the Bering Strait, who, uh, you know, possibly a descendant of Gigantopithecus, which is something, uh, you know, a, a huge, possibly bipedal ape-like creature that lived thousands of years ago in Asia, and if it something like that had come over here and sort of disseminated across the U.S., uh, you know, perhaps pri- prim- primarily in the Pacific Northwest at first and then kind of moved around. It's, I mean, it's improbable, but it's not impossible that, that, that that's happened and that would explain what people are seeing. Um, so I've always kind of stayed within the uh, thought that these are, biological terrestrial creatures that uh, have just somehow miraculously avoided, you know, proof and detection all this time. 
Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of theories. I think the longer we go researching this without any better answers than what we've had in the last 50 years, then, you know, people get other theories. So I, I, I just don't know what they are until we have a type specimen to examine. But that's, that's just my kind of operating uh, hypothesis. Yeah, I think we uh, will definitely need a, a specimen before we can figure out what it is. But I, uh, I think it's a some type of ape as well. Um, so why do you research? Do you do it for yourself? Do you uh, just do it for the encounter or a possible encounter? More knowledge. I think all, kind of all of it, um, you know, first because it's just a subject I like and, you know, it's something I, you know, when you're a kid, you're in the woods, you know, we joke about Bigfoot, you're, you're not really seriously thinking about it in terms of, you know, the ramifications if these things exist and are they really out there so as an adult, it's cool to kind of evaluate all those things as you're out there in the woods, all the stories and interviews I've heard. Um, and I also just love the outdoors. I love nature. And this makes it a little more exciting to be out there. If you're, It gives me some reason to be paddling around in a swamp in the middle of the night in the dark, <laughs> just, you know, which I think is cool. And it brings me to... It gives me a a reason to go to places I would have never gone to before. Like if I'm researching for a book, for example, um, then I sort of have a focus on why I need to go to this, you know, forested region way over here in Alabama or wherever I'm going. Um, it's kind of fun. It just creates a purpose. And then at the same time, the the possibility of having my own encounter is always there. It's ever present, and if I put myself in those places, you know, enough, then my chances are up. If I could see something um, as to what people have described, you know, seeing, um, so that's you know that's kind of keeps you the adrenaline going, and that's fun, and and of course <laughs> you know I just I'm a you know, I'm a professional writer and musician and writing books, and these are the fun. They may not be the b- biggest selling genre of books, but they're the funnest to write. So, <laughs> for that reason, it's it's like a it's like a constant adventure um, in researching and writing these books, and it's fun. So I just I do it for all of those reasons. So, um, Bigfoot aside. What is one of the cryptids that you've written about that you wish more people knew about? Uh, What's your your favorite cryptid besides Bigfoot, I guess? I guess my favorite besides Bigfoot would be, well, Lizard Man, I I would have to say, is is probably my, my favorite, just kind of that creature from the Black Lagoon vibe. But um, beyond that, I like the Mothman sightings, and that it's, doesn't it doesn't neatly fit into a cryptid category because a lot of that case has some paranormal aspects to it. But you know, at the core, people were in this area of West Virginia and saw some kind of a thing, a huge flying entity of some sort which, you know, looked man-like in some aspects, and it looked, you know, large, and it scared them. So in that in that regard, it's kind of a cryptid. So, so I think Mothman is, is right up there with my favorites. And, um, mm-hmm. But, I mean, there's, there's so many cryptids that for different aspects I like. You know, there's, there's lake monster sightings and... There's even a lot around our our home grounds, like the Lake Worth Monster near Fort Worth, where I was where I was born. Um, 
I like the Lake Worth Monster just because it's kind of really in my backyard. I didn't hear about it at the time because this was in the 60s, so it was before before I knew about any of this. But, um, you know, Lake Worth Monster is probably another of my favorites. Can you tell me more about the Lake Worth Monster? Because I feel like I know the general idea of it, but I don't know a whole lot of background on that one. This was... um, an incident or incidents that started in the summer of 1969 and uh, between Fort Worth and Dallas um, back in those days, it wasn't one giant contiguous city. There was some, uh, there was still some woods out there and in this area called Lake Worth, which is created from uh, the West Fork of the Trinity river. um, People, started talking about some kind of a a monster for lack of a better term and one evening um so a couple was parked out there um near lake worth in an area where you know it was kind of like where they were uh you know people went to park and make out and drink beer and all that and uh they had a convertible and they had the top down and this thing jumped out of the trees and tried to grab the girl and they kind of scrambled around and and drove off and went down to a cafe stopped in used a payphone to call the police and they their description of this thing was it it looked kind of white possibly had fur they said it it looked it, it might have had horns it might have had scales. So the first, the next morning, this appeared in the Fort Worth Star Telegram in a big article. It says something like "Fishy Goat Man uh, Attacks Couple at Lake Worth" or, or something that, along those lines. And and then this became like, uh, you know, a big news story. And people um, went down there to hunt the monster. And the next night there was about 40 people standing out there and they saw this thing run up on, on this, uh, hill over this place called the pit. And it, it grabbed a tire. There was a bunch of trash up there, grabbed a tire and hurled it across there and everybody scattered. And that was in the newspaper. And then as the story went on, the descriptions kind of leveled out that it was some sort of an upright creature and it was covered in white hair. And that kind of fitted into the Bigfoot category because um, there has been sightings of Bigfoot-like creatures with light-colored or white hair. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know how many, one in 50 sightings or something, but every once in a while people will say, I saw one with white hair. So um, I researched this pretty well, and it's written up in my there's a big section in my book beyond my beyond boggy Creek book where I talk about the Lake worth monster. And I also talk about other sightings in this area that, um, where people had reported seeing white, um, type creatures. So, um, it's possibly a Bigfoot, but it had a lot of other, uh, kind of urban legend stuff to it, like the goat man and everything. And it was, uh, -hmm. it was a big deal back here in the, you know, in the 60s, and people still remember it. And there was a book written, uh, Sally Ann Clark wrote a book on it back in those days. So um, for people who lived around this area, it was just kind of the, you know, the wo- monster of the woods story um, that became mm-hmm. famous. It's pretty interesting. Uh, which, which incidentally, <clears throat> I get all that's been developed up a lot now. There's there's a nature preserve out there now, but people ask if there's still sightings, but really, there really isn't. I mean, it's just, if Dallas-Fort Worth has just been developed so much that it's kind of, you know, there's a pocket of forest, but there's no, and it's still the, the Trinity River, but it's, it's not like it used to be back in mm-hmm. the 60s. All right. It's probably hard for people to understand that story um, without thinking about how it used to be versus what it looks like now. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I occasionally get people telling me of sightings, but the better ones are when, you know, people have told me of ones that have been in that time frame or even preceding that. 
you know, I had a woman tell me her father used to talk about seeing a white ape out in Decatur, which is Decatur, Texas, is not far from Lake Worth. Um, and he saw something out there in like 1954. Now, he had no way of knowing about the Lake Worth monster stories or any of that, you know. I mean, he just, and he was adamant he had seen a white ape. And, of course, if you're talking 1954, this was before anybody knew of the terminology of Bigfoot. If you saw something in the woods, mm-hmm. the best you could say is it's an ape. Nobody said, nobody thought of it as Sasquatch or Bigfoot because nobody knew what that was really in this area. So I always thought that was very interesting that somebody had reported a sighting by a quote-unquote white ape in a place that later would become famous for a some kind of an upright thing with white fur, you know. Mm-hmm. So whenever you're, so I know you probably get a lot of encounter stories given to you. Um, people, you know, hear why you're in town or hear what you do. Um, so you probably have like an internal catalog of a million stories at this point. Um so I have to ask, if I don't ask this question, my mother will throttle me because she always asks this question. Whenever <laughs> someone has told you of a <laughs> um, of a Bigfoot sighting, has anyone ever mentioned a UFO sighting at the same time? <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's a popular question. If If I speak at a Bigfoot conference, I don't get that question much, but if I speak at a paranormal conference, it's the first question when those hands go up every mm-hmm. single time. Um, and the answer to that is only a couple of times has somebody mentioned a UFO sighting in conjunction with them telling me a story of a Bigfoot encounter, um, as in we're talking about something that may have happened in proximity or in the same time frame as the Bigfoot encounter they're telling me. It's it's happened a couple of times, but by and large, Bigfoot sighting, no one ever says anything about a UFO. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I've looked into those in my newest book, uh, Momo, the, the Strange Case of the Missouri Monster. That was a story from the 70s in, in Missouri um, about a... Bigfoot-like creature seen there. In this case, there were a lot of UFO sightings in conjunction with that. So I had to kind of evaluate whether <laughs> there was any possibility of connection between the two. And ultimately, mm-hmm. the best we could say is sometimes in talking about paranormal um, incidents, there are chorus, you know, there are. Um, corresponding sightings of Bigfoots in which people have also seen strange lights in the sky. But there's no way to mm-hmm. say that they're connected. I mean, because we know people right. see UFOs and we know see, people see Bigfoot. So certainly at some point they're going to kind of converge and be reported in the same area at the same time. But does it really mean that, you know, our extra tr- our our outer space neighbors are dropping off their pets as people mm-hmm. <laughs> theorize to, to, you know, run loose in our woods. I just don't see it. That just sounds ridiculous, but, <laughs> um, a little too and, bizarre for even you. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, I don't know why would they need to come here to let out their Bigfoots and the description of Bigfoots are so much of our, Earthly, earthbound, you know, they're very similar to to human and ape characteristics. I mean, and that just seems too bizarre that something like that would exist on another planet. I mean, if they looked like some totally undescribable thing, maybe you were like, well, they don't come from Earth, sure. But uh, the other thing I looked into, especially when I was writing the Momo book, I tried to dig as much as I could to find if there was ever any reports where somebody said they saw Bigfoot actually get off of a UFO. And there was only two vague stories I could find that sort of fit into that realm. But beyond that, it was pretty much uh, 
kind of two separate things that occasionally would converge. Had to ask, so thank you you for answering. (laughs) Since we're on the topic, have you ever seen a UFO? No, I have not. I don't. I don't think so. Okay. Now I have seen a ghost. Let me just let me throw something out there that I have seen, so I don't come up negative on everything. But yeah, I've seen what (laughs) people would describe as a ghost, a whitish figure, and uh, all that. So. that's off the list. It's still, I mean, I've seen weird lights, but I don't think I've seen a craft or a UFO. So, still looking mm-hmm. for that. <laughs> uh, that um, was the uh, ghost story. I was, that was, was going to be my next question. If you'd had that paranormal encounter, <laughs> uh, would, would you be all right going into that story? Or no, no problem. Uh, oh. So b- back in. This was back around the time I was in high school, um, you know, and, and when and when I talked about being interested in cryptids and all that stuff when I was young, I also loved, you know, ghosts and anything that went with all that. You know, I'd watch documentaries like Chariots of the God, I loved the UFO thing, and um, so I was kind of into all of it. And early on, I used to do ghost research um, without really even knowing what I was doing, but I'd go to cemeteries and put out cassette recorders on graves and do all this kind of stuff and so I was kind of vaguely you know just enough interested in in it but uh my a guy uh who I went to high school with had said that he and his family had seen a ghost in their home on several occasions and I was like oh that's cool man you know whatever and several of my of our friends had also said they had seen it. Um, so one night I was sitting in his living room, kind of watching TV, waiting for him to get ready so we could go somewhere. And out of the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of this whitish figure that walked from the front room across to a hallway. And of course, when I caught a glimpse of it, I kind of turned and looked because at first, you know, your natural instinct is there's a person or whatever, and you just naturally kind of turn and look. Um, But I got a brief glimpse of what, almost like what you think a ghost would look like. It was a kind of a whitish figure, somewhat transparent. Um, It walked, looked like a person, and it, uh, about the size of a, of a young boy or a young young person, um, and it walked by, and and so I called out to my friend. I was like, "Dude, I just saw the ghost walk right by there." And he goes, "Yep, that's that's where we've seen it a bunch." And he was just real nonchalant about the whole thing. You know, they had seen it, and his his parents had seen it, and so I just thought, "Wow, cool!" And now I've seen it, and I, I didn't know how to explain it. You know. But uh, that's that's exactly what I saw. Okay, that is that is pretty cool. I've I've seen one. Um, I don't I, I I don't like ghosts as much as I like Bigfoot, but uh, I still like hearing <laughs> stories as long as I don't have to see them. <laughs> Dustin um, has has do you have visitors in his home that he doesn't like to talk about <laughs> at night. He gets very upset. I stayed the night at Dustin's house before the last scout trip, and when we woke up, I told him, I said, oh, I said, um, I said, by the way, I said, I think you have two children in your home um, that live here, uh, two visitors, and he told me to shut up. He didn't believe me, and I said, no, seriously. (laughs) I said, during the night, I said, I am, I thought that his, he has two little girls, and um, I thought that they were standing by the chair, and I thought that they saw me and, you know, were sneaking up to, you know, wake me up because, you know. Anyway, so I was waiting on the youngest one to come over, and I was going to let her cuddle with me on the couch. And um, they they were so quiet. They didn't make any of the normal human noises, like moving on the carpet or giggling or breathing or anything. And so I looked back again, and they were both standing there, and I just kind of glanced, and I was like, oh, okay, those are not Dustin's kids. All right, cool. So I went back to sleep, 
and uh, woke up the next day, told him, and he would not discuss it until we were in the truck because he didn't want to discuss it in his home. And we get in the truck, and he kept telling me to <laughs> shut up, and I said, I said, no. I said, was it Daisy and CJ? I said, because I don't know. And he said, he was like, Daisy's not even here right now. She's with her mom. And I was like, oh, okay. Anyway, he gets very upset when I talk about it. Um, I don't know why. They're very nice kids. They're very helpful. They keep his daughter entertained, you know. <clears throat> That's pretty creepy. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it is. Uh, but, He's out in his shop right now, or else he would make me shut up because he doesn't want me to talk about it. We have a listener question. Um, one of our listeners yeah. wants to know, what is the creepiest place that you have researched for one of your books? Um, well, I mean... I mean, Boggy Creek is pretty creepy. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's just got an ambiance. Now, I don't know if that's, and I'm sure you guys agree. It's we know a lot about the history of it, and some of the there's a movie, and it's almost like is it creepy because it's creepy, or is it creepy because I'm, you know, predisposition to think it's creepy. But there is something strange about it, I think, in in spots that just probably correspond to why it's got a history of, of strangeness um that but beyond that uh I, i'm probably going to say that the creepiest place is uh the mclinic wildlife management area which is the area in point pleasant west virginia where the mothman sightings occurred uh i've been up there on several occasions and out there at night and there is definitely something bizarre about that place that you just can't put your finger on and i think many people will agree to that um anybody who's been been up there just kind of gets that vibe and that may be indicative of the mothman case because the mothman case like i said is so so much more bizarre with all sorts of phenomenon that perhaps this area, you know, has has something to do with that because it's just purely purely got a strangeness to it that you don't find other places. Um, so those are those are some of the, the creepier places. In, in a runner-up would be Brown Springs in Oklahoma, um, where mm. some strange things have happened. It's a, it's a creepy place for some reason, and. Uh, you know, those are those are some of the creepiest I've been personally been to. Okay. Um, we have a listener that wants to know if you have had any encounter stories given to you or um if you have personally experienced um anything to do with shadow people. Shadow people. Uh you know, I've I've gotten some some reports that sort of fall into that category um, from ranging from people saying they've seen shadow people in their homes, um, sort of it's like a, like a ghost encounter, but, but different, you know, to where they felt this was a entity that could be described as a shadow person. Um, And I've gotten others, that kind of fall into I don't know what category, but they they weren't in their homes and they were in wooded areas in which they saw uh, shadowy type entities of some sort, and these range from just something that walked across in front of them to um, to weird. <laughs> One person described like a person came up and talked to them and then just sort of disappeared, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. So they kind of fall somewhere, I guess, between ghost and otherworldly beings. But yes, I definitely get those kind of things. And, um, and those are certainly ones that I don't, if I'm not researching for a specific book or something, I just think if they're if they're good encounters and the person seems credible, I definitely take the report and file it away because at some point, mm-hmm. you know, I can make I could uh, put those together with some theme or or what have you. But um, 
but I love right. getting those stories. So I really just try to follow up on whatever I can if I've got time, just mm-hmm. because it's always interesting to collect those, and who knows when it might come in handy later. Even if somebody tells me something similar, I go, oh, man, I, you know, somebody else told me this, and then I can kind of compare mm-hmm. the two together. Well, absolutely. That's pretty awesome. Um, I kind of, I, I feel like just being in this, um, just I don't know, just being even a Bigfoot researcher, I've gone to outings and people have just, you know, you get to talking about what's happened Bigfoot-wise and then people just start talking about other weird things that have happened and I just find it really fascinating how, um, I don't know how how weird things like that can come up, and um, it seems kind of random, but a lot of weird stuff out there that's um, not just relegated to Bigfoot. No, certainly. I mean, there's just so many strange things, and it all kind of falls under that same umbrella. But you know, I think that if you're at a, you know, if we're at a conference for an outing for Bigfoot. You're with you're with some people who are already open to the possibility of something like Bigfoot. So naturally, I think those kind of people pay more attention to thing unexplainable things that happen and remember them, mm-hmm. you know, and and within Definitely. you know tell it. So I think it's not that they they may be any different than anybody else it's just that they're they're more open-minded and paying attention to these strange things so um you know those are the kind of uh you just kind of one one phenomenon perpetuates stories of another Mm -hmm. that's definitely a good point um you do kind of have to be a little bit open-minded you can be very scientific in this um, topic and that's fine, but I think being a little bit more open-minded is, <clears throat> sorry, definitely more helpful whenever you're research researching everything, because you can miss some valuable stuff if you're just like, oh no. Yeah. yeah sure. I, know. I just think uh, you know, there's there's a certain science to it, and there's also. Uh, just trying to get a handle on all the phenomenon in and of itself. I mean, there's a lot of layers of interest within the Bigfoot thing itself, you know, from the, you know, the phenomenon of it, why are we so interested in it, to the sightings, to the science, to the possibility of it being a flesh and blood creature. So there's a lot of levels of interest, and um, they're all fascinating you know mm-hmm. um so we have a listener question he wants to know have you had any aggressive encounter stories um told to you from texas oklahoma arkansas louisiana all those kind of any of those states and yes. so do any of them stand out in your mind stand out among the rest uh yeah they're those are always you know some of the ones that catch your attention the most. I mean, um, because you hear of so many Bigfoot sightings where, you know, driving down the road, I saw something and it ran across. Okay. But then when somebody says, you know, they were chased by something or it showed some aggression, it's, uh, you know, it's eye opening. So yeah, I've gotten, uh, you know, I interviewed, uh, a guy that became a friend of mine, Mike Woolley, uh, who had a sighting in the 1980s in Louisiana uh, and he was hunting at the time and he was up in his deer stand and, uh, you know, he heard something coming, heard some strange noise and this, this, uh, fawn ran out of the woods and got right up under his, under his stand and sat there. And then a short time later, this ape-like creature came out and was visible. And, you know, his first reaction was, you know, is this a, a person in a suit is am I looking at a Bigfoot? What is this? You know, the sobering reality of that. And, uh, eventually, uh, the thing kind of displayed some, this sort of, you know, aggressive like behaviors. And then it turned and walked off. And at that point he was like, I can either sit here all night or I can run for it. So he, he got down out of that deer stand and took off running 
for his truck. And at that point, he could hear something coming through the woods. And he he hooked out and got on this uh, dirt road and was running down that. And whatever this thing was, was running alongside him just out of sight in the woods. And then he heard a second one. And they basically trailed him right up to his truck. And enough so he turned around and just started shooting his gun in that direction, although he couldn't really even see him, and jumped in his truck and drove off. And his feeling about it was is they, you know, they could have easily gotten him if they wanted to, but they, for whatever reason, wanted to drive him out of the area. Um, and, uh, you know, he was traumatized and scared by this, this incident. I mean, he's, he was a tough guy, a hunter, and it shook him up. Um, there's so many others. There was a lady up by Crook Lake in Texas um, some years ago that uh, they had a flat tire out, out by this lake, and her husband had to walk back to town to uh, to get some help. And while she was in there, three big Bigfoot, a uh, male and, and two female, walked up to that truck, and they tried to pull her out of it. <laughs> and uh, that's pretty creepy um there was the famous siege at honabi up in uh the honabi area kaimichi mountains in o- oklahoma mm-hmm. in which uh there was a, a many incidents going on in which these presumed bigfoots were trying to get in this house and they were stealing venison from the shed and uh the bfro was down there and these guys were shooting at them and it was just a, a bizarre story, but yeah, there, there's quite a few of those, um, aggressive, you know, stories. I mean, there's, there's by and large more just brief sightings than there are of those kind. But, um, if you check out my book beyond boggy Creek, I got a whole section on, uh, aggressive Bigfoot encounters in there and it goes all the most, the most prominent ones in the, in the Southern area are in there. Awesome. Um, so on the flip side, have you had any um, interactive encounters told to you, like um, nice interactive encounters? Um, I have. The, I would say that the thing about some of those I've had is they've been the least credible witnesses, in my opinion, mm-hmm. um, which have described – things like that um where mm-hmm. i don't know some some close interaction or gifting and this and that uh not in the music it just could be the people that are telling me the stories but i found that those seem to be almost um the most unbelievable or the most um the, the witnesses and the kind that I wouldn't even include in my books, because, I mean, I get more stories than I would write about or include in things. So I just toss out the ones that I don't mm-hmm. think are credible. I, there's plenty of good ones, but um, but I can't think of any any interactive one offhand that I thought was really even worth uh, you know noting as, as a possibility. Almost every case... Either the thing was seen probably on accident, it did not want to be seen, or it was displaying some kind of a territorial aggression. Gotcha. Dustin, did you have any other uh, questions? Oh. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, one of our listeners wanted to know if uh, you and Ken were going to do any more uh, research videos. Uh, yeah, and talking about the American Monster Tour thing we just posted on YouTube, we had originally, um, we shot that one and it was finished as a, the concept for our, our own show. And we shot one other one, um, which has not been completed. So we hope to finish the other one. The problem with the whole thing was we had teamed up with a, a producer and, um, cameraman who we were going to basically circumvent network television. Um, you know, both Ken and I have been on plenty of shows and we're not always happy with, um, 
you know, them having the control and in the what they want to do. And we wanted to do a show where it was just literally following us around doing real research, which is a challenge to make an interesting show because a lot of real research is academic or sitting around or it's boring. But um, I think we created something that's realistic and, and just follows us around. The problem was is the producer and cameraman um, decided they they couldn't continue and we didn't have the funds to continue to to do it if we had to pay somebody because at the time it was a partnership. So um, we just literally, this is the problem. We have no money to do the right kind of show, you know, but if you want to do a network show, now you've got to compromise in some ways conceivably to get it done. So the answer to that is we have one other film and we're hopefully – eventually can get it finished but beyond that there's there is no show without funding basically mm. hey uh, another question uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, the boy from North Carolina that went missing for two days and said he hung out with the angelic bear Do you remember that story yeah yeah yeah, and that's, you know, there's been several of those kind of things that come up in Politi's Missing 411 books where um, these young young kids say they were, I was taken care of by a bear. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, without having interviewed the boy or, or something personally, it's just really hard to say, um, but, mm. um, but I mean, it's of my opinion that if, if Bigfoot creatures exist, then certainly they could display some kind of um, perhaps motherly attention to a human, the same as we've seen in occasionally with great apes. Um, you know, we've seen some cases where a you know a female gorilla or something will uh, be protective of a lost child, um, and so you know you can kind of make a jump and say that that Big, Bigfoot could very well do the same because it's harder to imagine that a bear would do that because uh, they're just, I mean, not to say that it's impossible, but bear are a little further from human than, 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 than great apes. So, um, you know, I think that's a, a possibility, although I don't, you know, if the kid, it, it really just depends on how much – how much this kid knows about bears. I, I have to interview him, you know, when my, yeah. I'm trying to think, you know, we, when my daughter was three, did how much of a handle did she have on what is a bear and what is a Bigfoot? I don't know, but uh, I don't know. In some of those cases where kids had disappeared and they were unharmed, unscratched, and they had been obviously carried somewhere, I just don't see a bear having carry, carried them. And if they say, oh, a bear carried me into the woods, I mean, come on, bear, big claws, they don't, they're not going to pick them up like, like a, a great ape could. So, um, yeah, I think those are interesting thing. And it's, it, who's to say, maybe, maybe the kid was taken care of by a Bigfoot. So there's your, there's your good heartwarming interactive story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, my son thinks that Chewbacca is a Bigfoot, and he was about three when he decided that, So, and there was no talking him out of it. He wanted to know what that Bigfoot's name was, and I told him Chewy, and he said, Chewy? He said, that's a funny name for a Bigfoot. <laughs> that's how they think. They think in, you know, like, yeah. like not that, that there was a Bigfoot, it's that it had a weird name. That's what was weird to him, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's a space Bigfoot, so he, you know, they got weird names in space. So, you know, obviously. I didn't even tell him that part. <laughs> Guess I should have. Um, all right, so we have about 15 minutes left, and I would like to know, are there any new projects that you're working on that you would like to kind of, you don't have to tell us in detail, but um, just you can be vague or give us spoiler or, you know, just something exciting that you're working on? 
Okay. Well, yeah, I can I can do that. I'm seem to be always working on a number of projects. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> let's see. The one coming up, as people may or may not know, I work with Small Town Monsters um, out of Ohio on documentaries, and we've I've been involved in quite a number of those. Um, I'll be working on and narrating uh, an upcoming one called The Mothman Legacy, which is a follow-up to our film The Mothman of Point Pleasant, which came out several years ago. So I'll be the narrator on The Mothman Legacy and um, give us an opportunity to follow up on some of the other um, uh, reports of of Mothman-type activity that occurred after the initial flap in 66 and 67. So we're excited about that. Um, I have a new book coming out uh, called Sinister Swamps. And I've just recently announced that, but it's a book I've literally been working on for about 10 years over time. um, And in which I explore some of the most notorious swamplands of North America and, and, and discuss the strange phenomenon and spooky stories that have come out of those areas. So I'm kind of excited about that because um, most of the books so far have been based on a, on the cre- on a creature and the effects on the town in a one very small location and one type of creature other than the Momo case, which kind of had some other weird aspects, as I mentioned. But um, with Sinister, Sinister Swamps, I'm more focused on a type of um, uh, geographic location, and within that I can discuss all sorts of strange things that go on. And, I mean, this includes, of course, a lot of cryptid activity, um, ghost reports, um, stories and legends of witches, um, buried treasures, lost planes, anything that has you know, has to do with the legends and lore of these uh, swampy areas. So, and some of these are very, you know, close to home and ones I've been to plenty. Caddo Lake um, is a swampy area in East Texas. Um, uh, Okafenoki Swamp out in Georgia. Skapor Swamp, of course, is where the Lizard Man. And, uh, of course, you know, I, I can't overlook Mercer Bayou, which is the swampy area associated with associated with the legend of Boggy Creek, and uh, and of course uh, I'm including uh, kind of it's kind of worked out in a strange way, but uh, it kind of it, that's close to the end of the book, and one of the most recent possible encounters was by uh, Dustin, and when I heard about that, I thought man, this is just like strange timing. So it includes, um, you know, people I know that have had strange encounters. So, um, you know, for all those reasons, the book is is going to be pretty cool, and it should be out around April, I'm I'm thinking. I I no longer use publishers anymore. I did originally on my books, but then I realized, why do I need these people? So now I'm on my own schedule, which is a little more like, Whenever I can get it done, it comes out. I don't have to wait a year, a year and a half later um, from getting the publishing deal before it comes out. So hopefully we'll get it get it out by by April. Um, awesome. Pretty I, awesome. I cannot wait to get it. <laughs> this is kind of like my chance to, in, in, in some ways, you know, some of these reports I've taken, like we talked about earlier, where it's like I get a really bizarre report, but I don't know what to do with it because... You know, a lot of my books have been, you know, Bigfoot subjects, or they've been in this specific area. But, um, you know, I've got a lot out of from swamps over the years. So I thought, man, this is cool because I can start putting these in there. Um, because it really didn't matter what it was; it was just that it had come from that area. <laughs> and I think when people, if you, if you get the book and you read, you know, if you read about the Everglades or whatever you're going to know like more than you ever knew about the really bizarre stories that come out of this specific area. So that next time you go there to visit, you'll be looking over your shoulder and you'll be, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, poking in the water, looking for lost planes or whatever it is. Uh, It was just a fascinating 
kind of research mission. And in in some ways, I just do this because I like it so that I'm discovering all these cool stories um, as I research, the same as when the readers come along the journey, you know, you're learning about things um, that you may not have, you know, heard about before. So it's hopefully uh, people will dig the book. Well, I'm excited I think for it. you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, where can people find your find your books? It's online, Amazon. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you can of course available on Amazon, um, BarnesandNoble.com. Some of them are on there on Barnes and Noble. Um, available in ebook and and uh, paperback and even some hardbacks. Um, and then really the best place to find out information would be my own website at lyleblackburn.com. And that's got links to all the books and movies and even my music. Um, so you can kind of use that as a jumping off point to, um, you know, to follow the subjects you may want to check out. And uh, I've got my own online store that has Boggy Creek t-shirts and other things. Um that would not be available on Amazon. Um, so yeah, check that out. And also drop by falcmonster.net um, if you want to learn more about the, the Boggy Creek case specifically. I've got a sighting log on there. Um, you can see sightings over the years. I get I see this on Facebook a lot. I see people post under a picture of I I post a picture of Boggy Creek and people say, "Are there still sightings there today?" Well. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. he probably doesn't have my book, I guess, but hey, you can go to this, you know, I, I, for that purpose, the quick list, you can check out falconmonster.net, and uh, and that's got, you know, kind of an overview of everything that's been going on historically in Boggy Creek, information about the books and movies, and that sighting log that will tell you that, um, you know, a young man was there in December in Mercer Bayou area, and and saw something um, among the trees. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so is, uh, if you if you if you know what I mean, Dustin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was flattered that you called me young man. So, um. <laughs> well, you know, I just wanted it to sound sound uh, sound. You know, to the one just generically, it was. It was that, but specifically, yes. Mm. You you are young, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, on those websites that uh, that you listed, uh, is there a link on those where people could contact you um, to give you in- their encounters? Yeah, yeah, if, if, yeah. If you're on my site, uh, it all kind of leads somewhere to me. And, uh, yeah, my uh, contact is on there. So yeah, if anybody's had anything, um, you know, seen anything strange that uh, fits into this realm, definitely let me know. Um, I'm starting to. I've been really trying to collect uh, specifically. I've got another project where I'm going to be visiting, revisiting uh, some of the. Falk and, and Arkansas sightings in general. So I'm really trying to round up anything that's, you know, from that area as far as sightings over the years. So if anybody's got any bad, just definitely contact me that way. Awesome. All right, Dustin, do you have any last questions? Um, it, don't you have a, a new album coming out? Yes. I have that too. Uh, sometimes it's a lot, um, but yes, I my uh, I've I write the books, but I've been a musician most all of my life, and that's part of my I guess career path. Um, and my band Ghoul Town, which you can get uh, a link from my site to, uh, we're about to re- go in the studio to record a new album, which we do every several years and uh so that should be out later this summer provided i don't collapse somewhere in between but um so yeah this 
this is a this is a brand new full length album and it's been a couple of years since our last one so we're excited to get in the studio and to uh to get that going that's awesome all right uh, i think that's all the questions i have tonight do you have any Lauren? um not really uh looking forward to having you at the falcon monster camp out this weekend and we appreciate you uh, coming to support Alex Smith Park. I know you've probably been there more times than you can count. Absolutely. I, I wouldn't miss it. So, yeah, it's an exciting uh, opportunity to to hang out with some like-minded people and enjoy the uh, beautiful and spooky uh, realm of Falk, Arkansas. And, you know, and certainly Smith Park does deserve some as much funding and assistance as it can be given because it's a free place. That's one of the most awesome things is that people go, where can I camp? Mm-hmm. We can camp here and it's free and it's right next to a, mm-hmm. you know, a scenic lake. So it's a great place and, mm-hmm. um, you know, a great place, a, 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 you know, a great thing to benefit through this camp out. So hopefully everybody will join us, um, you know, the whole time or at least one of the days. All right. Well, thank you for um, adding your support in there, and um, every and so I know that people are going to um, want to come up and talk to you. And you seem like a pretty friendly guy, and that you're always inviting people to come talk to you and um, talk about your books and your works and everything. Yeah, I'm pretty friendly, I suppose. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I just uh, I'll be there hanging out. So. Definitely uh, come out. I'll, I'll bring some books and T-shirts and what have you, but I uh, always look forward to uh, just hanging out with, with everybody. And It's like one giant, great, awesome family. Yeah, it's awesome. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for coming on tonight, Lyle. I really appreciate it. Um, this has been a great interview. Um, and I know... Lauren has enjoyed it a lot because she's a huge fan of yours. Well, I really appreciate you, <laughs> yeah. you got, y'all having me on anytime. Yeah, thank you for coming on, and uh, we will see you this weekend. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Um, so, everyone, because the Scout Monster Campout is this weekend, um, and we have had Lyle on tonight. We will not be having a show this Wednesday, so we will see everybody else next week if you can't make camp out. Hold on, the blog talk lady is yelling at me. And uh, so everybody have a great week, and we will holler at you all next time. Good night, everybody. Bye.